Hello and welcome. We're so glad that you can join us this evening. We are live and we are continuing with session number four of our live online Bible study on the Gospel of Luke. Tonight we are in Luke chapter one. Luke chapter one. If you want to follow along in your Bibles, we'll be in Luke chapter one. Uh, I hope that you'll join us each week, when every week, with Bibles in hand and a pen and a pad of paper and uh, just jot down notes and, and items of interest that you may want to look up on your own. Luke chapter 1. From the home of Zacharias and Elizabeth in the mountainous Judea, Luke shifts to the scene to the rolling hills of Galilee to a teenage girl who's dreaming about her future. Her life is just starting to bloom, and Mary peers into the coming years with hopeful eyes. How will God use her? Whom will she marry? When will she have a family of her own? And one day her parents unveiled their plans for her to marry Joseph the carpenter, and Mary's mind whirls as she absorbs this news and tries to picture herself as Joseph's wife. By night, she imagines how she's going to arrange her furniture and decorate the rooms and how fortunate that Joseph is a carpenter and he can make what they cannot afford to buy. By day, with needle and thread, she works her dreams into linen. And when she dreams again, it's of children. Lord, Make me as fruitful as Leah, but beloved as Rachel. Let me live to see my children's children. But never in her wildest imaginings does she foresee the child of God uh, as uh, will come to her future. Life's ordinary things fill her mind now. A husband, a home, a family... But then she comes face to face with an angel, and all at once, everything is changed. Mary meets the same exact angel that Zacharias encountered in the temple. However, no burning coals and sacred altar surround Gabriel's appearance this time. Instead, he comes without ceremony to the humblest of villages. In verse 26, of Luke chapter 1, we read these words. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now according to Luke, God sent Gabriel to Nazareth during the sixth month, referring to Elizabeth's pregnancy. Now Nazareth was a trifling town just located off the main trade routes. Some have thought that the city housed a troop of Roman soldiers. Certainly, its moral reputation was less than shining among the Judean uh, Jews. Uh, Nathaniel voiced the popular sentiment towards the city and its surly citizens when he said, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Well, yes, answers the one who sees the goodness of the heart. For in Nazareth... An angel appeared, and we read in verse 27, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Now, twice in these verses, Luke refers to Mary as a virgin. Parthenos in the Greek, which means in this context, one who had not yet had sexual relations. And it's important for us to understand the Jewish betrothal customs of that day. When the two mothers and the two fathers were agreed, the Kiddushin took place. Now that's a formal betrothal and much more binding than any other. The Kiddushin has the finality of marriage. Once the marriage contract was negotiated, even though the marriage ceremony had not yet occurred, the bridegroom-to-be could not be rid of his betrothed except by decree of divorce. If Joseph 
<coughs> had to have died between uh, Kiddushu and marriage, uh, Mary would have been his legal widow. If, in the same period, another man had knowledge of her, Mary would have been punished as an adulteress. Uh, during her engagement, Mary's purity was under scrutiny. God, however, chose this time to send Gabriel with some wonderful yet unsettling news. We read in verse 28. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Mighty Gabriel deals gently with Mary, who is, remember, just a young teenager, uh, perhaps only between 13 and 15 years old. Uh, he calls her favored one, which is the old Latin version reads uh, gratiae plena, or full of grace. In essence, the angel is saying, you are full of grace, which you have received. You are, in a unique sense, a divinely favored person. God has chosen her above all other women to receive this gift. And the angel just marvels at the God's grace on her life. But Mary has no idea why he has appeared to her. Verse 29 of Luke chapter 1 says, But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. <clears throat> and quickly Gabriel continues in verse 30. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. For generations, Mary's people have anxiously awaited for the great deliverer, the one whom Gabriel describes. Devout ones have searched the prophecies for clues about him. Fathers had taught their children to watch for him. Mothers have peered into the eyes of their newborns, wondering whether their child might be the Holy One. And now God, in his infinite wisdom, has said, Enough waiting. The Messiah will come now through the womb of a virgin. Now that last part is what really gnaws at, at uh, Mary's brow because she is not yet married and she decides that maybe this will be a good time to interject a question. So verse 34, she says, then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? Now, if you remember last week's lesson, we saw that Zacharias, in unbelief, requested a sign. Now Mary, on the other hand, she doesn't necessarily ask for proof. She just simply wonders about the process. How can a virgin have a baby? So the angel just graciously explains in verse 35, the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Notice the presence of the Holy Trinity represented in the conception of Jesus. The Holy Spirit will come upon Mary and he will spark that divine life in, in her human being. And, and the power of the highest will enshroud her, preserving the purity of the embryo and producing the Holy One, the sinless Son of God. So we have the Father, Son, and the Spirit all present, all represented when Jesus was conceived. Why did God select such an involved process for the conception of Jesus? 
He had four options at his disposal. Number one, he could have used a good human father and mother, which would result in all humanity, but no deity. He could have created a special being, like, a, like an angel, with no father or mother, which would be all deity, but no humanity. He could have deposited his spirit into another person's body, which would prevent him from being either fully or truly human. Or he could have miraculous, miraculously conceived a baby within a virgin, which would produce a child, which would be both fully divine and fully human. And because the birth of Jesus is intimately tied to every other aspect of his life, he had to be born of a virgin. The virgin birth is the gate that guards his sinlessness and the door through which God stepped into humanity. Without it, we have no perfect sacrifice. We have no Savior. <clears throat> and ultimately, we have no hope. Mary, however, cannot see through the midst of theology that surrounds the moment. She just understands that God is planning to do something impossible in her body. And to further open her mind to God's limitless possibilities, Gabriel goes on to tell her in verse 36 of Luke chapter 1, Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her, who was called barren. For with God... Nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me. Now with that, Gabriel concludes his message. Mary will bear God's son, but because she is unwed, the privilege comes with a price. Accusations of indecency, pointed fingers, cloaked whispers, would she be willing to offer herself on the altar of God's plan? Mary has, in effect, entered her own Gethsemane. Enter with her and watch her beautiful submission to the Father. In verse 38, Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now in just a matter of a few minutes, the encounter is over. And Mary sits alone in stunned silence. But before long, her heart starts bubbling over like a fountain. And she, she realizes she's going to have a baby. Her eyes sparkle. Her face glows. But the words sort of dam up in her throat. Who is she going to tell? Joseph, naturally, is the first person to whom she pours out her secret. Unfortunately, according to Matthew's gospel, Joseph just doesn't quite understand what's going on. You know, what if the rabbis hear about this, he wonders. She will be stoned as an adulteress, if not as a blasphemer for this wild tale about God being the father of her baby. What's he going to do with her? He loves her, but how can he marry her under the circumstances? You know, sadly, Mary's character has endured many vicious assaults dur during, you know, the last centuries. She's been called in the Talbot the mistress of a Roman soldier named Panthera, and Jesus is called an illegitimate child as well. Now, this is the lowest view of Mary, but it's not unlikely that some sharp tongues in Nazareth made her feel the force of this biting slur. And in John chapter 8, verse 41, the Pharisees imply that Jesus had been conceived in sin. Mary... Catholics revere her as the queen of heaven. Most Protestants skip over her as a background character in the story of the birth of Jesus. So who is right? 
And where do our ideas come from? In our quest for a balanced perspective, the one Luke's gospel calls blessed are you among women, let's examine both positions and evaluate them in the clear light of Scripture. First of all, let's take a look at the traditional Catholic perspective. Traditional Catholic teaching about Mary revolves around at least four different tenets. First of all, uh, they teach uh, Mary as a mediatrix. Now, that belief asserts that Mary mediates the salvation that Christ won for us on the cross and that none of God's graces come to us except through Mary. Now, this idea takes its roots from Mary's submission to God's will there in Luke chapter 1, verse 38, which to many Catholic theologians since medieval times means that Christ's incarnation and therefore the redemption of humanity depended on Mary's assent to God's plan. In other words, everything hinged on Mary agreeing to God's plan. Without Mary agreeing to bear Jesus, uh, they teach that we would have no Jesus, no salvation, no grace. Now, Protestants would argue that no human being could stand in the way of God's sovereign will and that there is only one mediator also between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. That's what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. A second tenet that the Catholics teach are the Immaculate Conception. Now, this is the belief that Mary herself was conceived without original sin. In other words, not only was Jesus born of a virgin, but the virgin herself had a miraculous birth. Um, and therefore, <coughs> she too was without sin. Therefore, Jesus could not be without sin unless Mary was without sin. Now, an older translation of, of uh, uh, Gabriel's greeting to Mary, an older English translation in, in Luke one twenty eight, is the source for this idea, where it says, Hail, full of grace. This grace, it is believed, was a perfect grace. And it being perfect meant that it could not have ever been imperfect. So Mary must have had this perfect grace from the time that she was conceived, hence the Immaculate Conception. Now Protestants would counter this with the frequent scriptural theme contained in Romans chapter 3 verse 23 that says, For all have sinned, yes, even Mary, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We also have the Catholics teaching the doctrine of perpetual virginity. This is the belief that Mary remained a virgin throughout all of her life. And scriptural basis for this is Mary's question to Gabriel in Luke chapter 1 verse 34, how can this be since I am a virgin? Well, Catholic theologians believe that Mary's words mean that she had taken a vow of celibacy, lifelong celibacy, and would never know a man. Protestants would take the more literal view of her words and also refers to the mention of the fact that Jesus had brothers and sisters. We can read that in Matthew chapter 13, again in Mark chapter 6. In fact, Jesus had a brother by the name of James who became the leader of the church in Jerusalem during the first century. So it's kind of hard to see how Mary could have remained a virgin. The fourth and final doctrine that's taught by the Catholics is the idea of the Assumption. This is the belief that Mary was taken bodily from earth to heaven so that she would not have to endure the corruption of of the grave. Now the line of reasoning goes something like this. If Mary was conceived without sin, then it would seem reasonable that the result of sin, death, would not be able to hold her, even as it was unable to hold her son. Now there's no biblical basis for this. 
It depends on traditional stories instead of actual scripture. Protestants would dismiss that tradition and rely solely on the authority of God's written word. Now, for fear of venerating Mary, Protestants have tended to go to the opposite extreme and practically ignore her. You know, we're eager to learn from such biblical mothers as Sarah and Isaac's mother and Rachel, Joseph's mother, and Jochebed, uh, Moses' mother, and Hannah, uh, Samuel's mother, and Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother. But when it comes to Mary, who was chosen by God to give life and nurture to Jesus, we back away for fear of appearing to worship her. And neither of these positions truly square with Scripture. Are you willing, like Mary, to submit your understanding to God's will and to his word? Then challenge your thinking about this admirable lady. Grab hold of a concordance and study for yourself the passages where she is mentioned by God's inspired writers. Learn from her example, just as you would from any other Bible character. Her life has much to teach us as well. She is to be neither exalted nor discounted, but held in esteem as a model of devotion, obedience, and faith. While Mary hurries to Judea and the refuge of Elizabeth's understanding arms, heartbroken Joseph wrestles with his options. And he finally puts the matter to rest with a just but kind plan. We read in uh, Luke ch Matthew chapter 1, verse 19, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away, uh, the King James says privily or, or secretly. While telling himself that he's doing the right thing, Joseph is interrupted by his own heavenly visitor, an angel who invades his dreams to confirm Mary's story. He too obeys God's call and decides that as soon as Mary returns from Judea, he will marry his precious virgin bride. Meanwhile, miles away from Joseph, Mary has arrived at Elizabeth's house. Elizabeth knows that she herself carries the forerunner, but where is the Christ? Well, the answer is made clear the instant that she hears Mary's hello. In Luke chapter 1, verse 41, it says, And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. At the sound of Mary's voice, Elizabeth's baby leaps in her womb as if to say, here he is. Then filled with the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth exclaims in verse 42, then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Mary's response, known as the Magnificent, echoes the feelings of everyone who has tasted from the eternal spring of God's grace. All at once, Mary's pent-up exuberance flows out of her heart in a song with scriptural allusions. Mary's declaration here closely resembles Hannah's prayer way back in 1 Samuel chapter 2 when she learns of the impending birth of her son, Samuel. Mary's response to God's working in her life just overflows with an enthusiasm that can nourish our tone times of worship. You know, there are really four sections that we see here to her worship. 
In verse 46, we read, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. Focus on Mary's name for the Lord. She calls him God my Savior. Have you seen this saving touch in your life? Just take a moment to express your own praise to God your Savior, who selected you as his special child. Verse 49, For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Notice the marvelous attributes of God in those verses. What does it mean to you that he is mighty? What does it mean that he is holy? merciful. Just take a moment to reflect on those attributes for worship. Then in verse 51, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their heart. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. Mary was a true princess in the eyes of the Father, not for her bloodline or for her wealth, but because of her heart. How have you seen God exalt the Marys of this world? Praise Him for lifting up the poor and the humble and for seeing you as royalty. Verse 54, He has helped His servant Israel in remembrance of His mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Mary reminds us here that God always keeps his promises. Just conclude your worship by expressing your faith in him to fulfill his promises to you in your future. Three months later, Mary returns to Nazareth to wed Joseph and to sail into a storm of controversy that would last the rest of her life. But she knows the real story about that wonderful gift God has given to her, and so do we. Let's draw a couple of applications, some truths from her life. First of all, no conception is ill-timed to those who realize that God is in full control. Now, you may never have thought of it this way, but Jesus was the result of an unplanned pregnancy. Perhaps you know someone who is pregnant right now with a baby that no one expected. Take comfort from the fact that God has a plan for that child. No creation of his is ever a mistake. A second truth we learn is, is that such a realization depends on one's perception and submission. By perception, I mean by the way that we look at life from either a human point of view or a divine point of view. Mary could have reacted to Gabriel's message from a human perspective. Well, I can't have a baby now. The timing's all wrong. But she remained open. When the angel finally unveiled the details, she saw things from God's per point of view, and she understood, and she obeyed. That's where submission comes into play. How do you see the events in your life? Do you live in the human horizontal plane, perhaps objecting because things are out of sync with your plans and your timetable? Ask the Lord to help you see things from his point of view. What seems like a problem today may turn out to be a gift from the hand of God. Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight. 
Lord, I thank you for each person that is tuned in to view this video. Lord, I pray your blessings upon them and their life. And Father, I just pray that uh, they too will worship you based on the worship of Mary in this verse. Lord, we just pray that we would be open to your will, to your way. We would be open to your plan in our life. Father, help us to be submissive. Lord, we just ask you to help us. Just draw our spirits to you. And just help us to listen to what you want to say to us. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Let me remind you that on Sunday mornings, we are currently in the middle of a Sunday morning sermon series from the book of Galatians, and we are calling that Galatians, the Gospel of Grace. Uh, this coming Sunday will be week number 10 of our series from the book of Galatians, and we're going to be looking in Galatians chapter 5 and examining the idea of the other side of Christian freedom. If you're unable to join us on Sunday in person, be watching for a video of the message to be posted sometime Sunday around noon, both on Facebook and on YouTube. Don't forget, we'll be back next Wednesday night at 6.30 for our live online Bible study on the Gospel of Luke. Next week will be session five of this study, looking at the birth of John the Baptist. So we're going to be talking about the prophet of the Most High, and we're going to still be in Luke chapter 1 next week. Uh, this Bible study on the Gospel of Luke is only online. It's the only place that you're able to view it. I hope that you can join us. If you miss any of the lessons, any of the sermons, you can check them out on Facebook, or you can also go to our YouTube channel and watch them there. Just type in Lebanon and First Church of God into the search bar on YouTube and you should be able to find our channel. If you have a Google account, a Gmail account, you can log into YouTube using that Google account and you can actually subscribe to our channel. So check that out. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.